Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. Fireside chat number, let me guess, 221. 222. 222. Not bad. This is Otto. Uh oh, Otto's awake. Bad sign. That means he might leave early again. This is his new thing, leaving early. So I am going to speak to the people who pay him because he he feels he's paid for a half hour. And if we start late, that's our problem. Anyway, that's Otto. I'm Dennis Prager. This is the Fireside Chat. It is a chance every week, and we haven't missed a week in 222 weeks, uh, to uh, share with you uh, some of the things that I have been thinking about. It's unrehearsed, no teleprompter, and then I take your questions. I have two uh, items uh, on my mind. The first is a phenomenon that you may not be aware of that explains a lot of what is happening in our society. And that is when the progressives, the woke, the left, speak on behalf of a group that they feel uh, is maltreated in the United States. And there's no maltreatment involved. So I'm going to give you three examples and show you how this has happened. But more important, I think, why it has happened. So example number one, we are told constantly that all rules with regard to identification when you vote are racist. That's actually what is said from the New York Times to CNN to your local teacher in your school, college, high school, or even elementary school. So you might have seen this, and if not, take a look. Ami Horowitz, who does these great man-on-the-street interviews, went in Manhattan where he lives and went specifically to Harlem, which is a largely black area of Manhattan, and just stopped people in the street and asked them, if they found it hard to get an ID, because that's the charge, that it is discriminatory against blacks because blacks apparently are really challenged when it comes to getting an ID. Whites somehow master this incredibly complex labyrinthine labyrinthine (laughs) uh, project of getting an ID uh, but uh, but somehow non, non-whites non just find it hard to navigate, so it's discriminatory. Anyway, watch the video. It's hilarious because they look at him like the question is, is idi- idiotic. You're asking me if I find it hard to get an ID? <laughs> that was the basic response. Or you, is, it, is it racist to ask that people have an ID? Anyway, every poll shows the majority of blacks believe in an ID for voting. Why wouldn't they? (laughs) So it's the joke is, as always, it's the left that is that is racist. The implication that blacks find it difficult to get IDs is is as racist as you can get. It's it's contempt. It's contemptuous. That's all it is. And they I remember from the video that they asked one woman, so where do you get it? Uh, uh, she said she told them the address of the mo- the motor vehicles bureau. I don't know where my motor co- motor vehicles bureau is where I live. She knew. Next example. This is this e- each one is is more absurd than the other. Latinx or Latinx, instead of Latino or Latina. Uh, you will see this in the New York Times. You will see this on CNN, uh, where where uh, on, on their website they spell the the plural of Latino or la- Latina as Latinx or Latinx, A L A N T I N X. So here's the question: Outside of academia, which is its own make believe world, is there one? Latino or Latina, one Hispanic who uses the word, oh, no, again, this is now becoming the regular thing. So people tune in and they go, where's Otto? All right. Anyway, what it is what it is. So no Latino says Latinx. It's an absurdity. 
And, and it is all created by, by the left, lest they do what? Lest they, they give uh, a gender to the word uh, uh, describing a Latin person, Latino or Latina. But that's the way Spanish is made. Spanish is male and female. There's nothing you can do about it. Latinx is absurd. Latinx is absurd. Or as I put it on my radio show in a promo, Latinx stinks. And, and that is what most uh, Latinos think. Most of them have no use for the term. It, w- look at the polls on that. This is all created by the left. That was a second example. I'm going to get to the question of why they do it in a moment. Oh, my God. Uh-oh. Two's a crowd. This, you know, I got to tell you, Otto, if you leave, uh, Snoopy will take your spot. It's be interesting to see what Otto does. So the third example is the, the uh, Washington football team, as it's now known. It, it was known for all of its history as the Washington Redskins. So, again, the left went crazy how racist Redskin is for the name of a team, how anti-Native American or anti-American Indian it is. Well, after agitating like crazy, the Washington Post, which is just a herd-like newspaper. They just go with the herd of the left. And they, they just were adamant about how racist Redskin is. So they commissioned their own poll among American Indians or Native Americans. Overwhelmingly, they didn't care. Now, I have to give the Washington Post credit. It published the results of its own poll. It must have been embarrassing, although it isn't. One of the things about the left is they're never embarrassed. It is one of the great virtues of being progressive. You're never embarrassed. Even when you're wrong, you're, you're not embarrassed, and, and there's no serious acknowledgement of your being wrong. So, again, what did we have here? The progressive, woke, left-wing crowd screaming about how terrible something is, on behalf of a minority, in this case, Native Americans, and it turns out that the minority doesn't give a damn. Forgive my language, but it doesn't give a damn. Three examples, there are so many others. So the question is, why do the progressives, why do the woke do this? Why do they make up a cause on behalf of 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 an allegedly mistreated group? The answer is they have to make it up because the groups aren't mistreated. This is, this is proof, there are many proofs, about how well blacks and Native Americans and Hispanics have it in the United States of America. There is no systemic racism. There are racists in America. Of course there are. There are anti-Semites in America. America is not systemically anti-Semite. And I say that not only as a Jew, as an active Jew, as it were, but as one who has written a very well-received book on anti-Semitism called Why the Jews. So I know this topic really, really well. This country is not anti-Semitic, let alone systemically anti-Semitic. But there are plenty of anti-Semites, and I'm sure there are racists. Of course there are. Though it is interesting that in my lifetime, I didn't meet one. And that, that is a, a, a funny thing to me. Why, why didn't I not meet one? In fact, it was interesting. A, uh, I had a young woman who was, uh, uh, who was uh, she has sat in for me at my, uh, at my radio show. And I had her uh, for a couple of weeks do my, do my email. The, my public DennisPrager.com emails, where I get a lot of emails. And she made a very intelligent point after two weeks. She said, I looked through hundreds, if not a thousand emails, and I didn't see one racist one. If you were racist or you appealed to racists, wouldn't you get racist email? It's a great, great point that she made. 
So this is a gigantic lie about America being systemically racist against blacks, against Latinos, or, or against American Indians or Native Americans. So what does the left do? They make stuff up. Latino is wrong. It should be Latinx. Redskins is wrong. It should be something else. Or IDs are wrong. That discriminates against blacks. Of course, the charge that it discriminates against blacks is itself the racism, not the ID. That's why there were so many race hoaxes in the country. Jussie Smollett is the most famous one, but they happen regularly. I, I, have, a whole, uh, I have a whole list of them in a column I wrote a couple of years ago. Since then, there's a whole other column I could write on how often the swastika or the N-word or the noose was put up by a black student at, on the, at the college dorm, not by a white racist. But if there's a lot of racism, why would there have to be any hoaxes? Right? It's an unanswerable question. So those are three, three great examples of where the left has to make up a problem because the real problem doesn't really exist. It's part of the terribly uh, destructive world that the left has created, lying about this country and making up examples of discrimination that are not even examples. Okay, we're good. And now, the video question of the week. Hi, Dennis. I'm Tyler. I'm uh, 20 years old, and I'm from Burbank, California. And uh, I just wanted to know, what are some uh, conservative uh, role models that you looked up to in your younger years? I'm, I'm asked this a lot about who, who were the, the people, who were the heroes of, of my youth. And I, I always feel awful. I feel like I must be something wrong with me if I can't give you an example Look, I, I, so I, I can only do what I do best and tell you the truth. So my father was a wonderful role model. So just in case, I, I, I always feel funny because I don't want to overstate or exaggerate in any way. He was not a hands-on father. He was not a, an emotional dad. He was not particularly affectionate when I was a kid. But you know what? In retrospect, he gave me something more important, and he did give me a model. He was strong, he was masculine, and those were really re and ethical. Ethical. He was very ethical. So he he was he, he gave me something more important than love. I, and I know this will sound odd in our love-soaked generation, not generation been since World War II. He gave me guardrails, rights and wrongs, that's what guardrails are, and he gave me a model. That was that's more important even than than affection. I know that sounds almost sick, but we have gone so far in the other direction. Oh, just love your kids up, love your kids up. A lot of parents love their kids up, but they're not great models. So the kid is confused. So anyway, uh, my, my father was a very good model. I didn't think of conservative models as a kid because I, first of all, I was a liberal. Uh, you know, I was born in New York and, I, and I'm uh, Jewish. So what am I going to be, a conservative? <laughs> it, it came with my birth certificate. It had... Those were the days when sex was listed and party, said Democrat. By the way, for the left, party is fixed. Gender, that's malleable. So uh, well, as I got older into my 20s, William F. Buckley uh, struck me as a particularly admirable uh, individual. And undoubtedly, there were others. Uh, but I'm now going to disappoint you. I think my biggest model outside of my family was an, a television character. Do you know this one? Okay, so this is my first time saying this. 
on the uh, fireside chat. So James Garner played the role of Maverick. It was a series on, it came, I think it came on Sunday evenings. He was Brett Maverick. His brother was Bart Maverick. And they alternated weeks. I never watched the Bart Maverick. It didn't interest me. But I did want to grow up to be Brett Maverick. And what was it that I loved about the character Brett Maverick? The man was cool under every circumstance. He never lost control. And I thought, that is cool. And if you watch that character for a few episodes, I'm sure it's on the internet. Remember, it's got to be James Garner and it's got to be Brett Maverick, not Bart. Uh, That made a big impact on me. And I did model myself in in behavior in, uh, in his way. Um, It's part of my ability to stay calm and cool was I I decided to to be that way uh, uh, in high school, watching Brett Maverick. There you go. Okay, let's see your uh, questions. I did it on the first try. Truett, 17 years old, Katy, Texas. Hi, Dennis. I am a senior at a public high school. I love education slash the pursuit of truth. And I am currently reading the Gulag Archipelago for the second time. Let me say this, Truett, that anybody, let alone a 17-year-old, would be reading the Gulag Archipelago, which is three volumes, for the second time, you are a collector's item. that's, that's, That's very impressive. Most people don't know what the Gulag Archipelago is, and, and that's very, very, very tragic. Uh, a- after Auschwitz, it is the best known, and you know, on the other and the other Nazi camps, it is the it is the best known place of mass murder and mass torture. It was in Siberia; it's where Stalin sent his opponents and people he just simply thought were opponents. <laughs> Because I have read the Gulag once before, I am now gaining a deeper understanding of what this great book says, and I'm beginning to truly realize the gravity, not to mention danger, of totalitarian ideologies. In light of this, I pose two questions to you. Do you think that a Gulag-like event will take place in the United States as the country moves towards the values of the left? Two, how do I get my friends who currently do not take the events of the 20th century seriously to grasp the gravity of our shifting political landscape? Thank you for the tremendous work that you do to this country and for the wonderful impact you've had on my life. Regards, Truett Smith. Will a Gulag event take place in the United States? Uh, I don't predict that it will. However, for the first time in my life, I believe it could. That's what has changed in me in the last two years. As I have seen half of my fellow countrymen accept and obey irrational laws. I am all for people obeying laws, but unquestioning obedience to the irrational is very scary. And that is what we have seen. The suppression of free speech on the part of the mass media that is a uh, that is an example of what would make a totalitarian totalitarian state possible in this country the acceptance of most americans of facebook and youtube and twitter shutting down people it differs with is very scary the canceling of people who say things that differ with the left, they are losing their job in one day, that an, a major editor, not reporter, editor at the New York Times was fired because he was in charge of publishing opinion pieces and he published a Republican senator's opinion. He was fired by the New York Times for publishing a Republican senator. 
Whew. This has never happened in the history of this country, such suppression of speech. So, it, so I, I am worried. How do you get your friends who don't know the events of the 20th century to grasp the gravity of the shifting political landscape? That's right. You don't know history. You don't get scared of what you should get scared of. Instead, you get you get scared of uh, being around people who are not wearing a mask. When you get scared of the wrong things, well, let's put it this way. If you're not scared of the right things, you get scared of the wrong things. The lack of knowledge of history is a very, uh, very big problem, too. Stefan, 36, Malden, Massachusetts. Hi, Dennis. I would like to comment on the fact that you make the effort to wear a suit or jacket and slacks and a tie on every fireside chat. On a personal note, if I ever became very wealthy, I would wear a three-piece suit every day. Okay, so let me offer you some uh, helpful note. You don't have to be very wealthy to wear a suit. Even three-piece suit. <laughs> I just want you to know that. It's a sign of class, not wealth, the way one dresses. And you talked about why you dress I did. I did an entire, I did an entire, a long time ago. Episode 80. Episode 80 on why I wear a tie and jacket on the fireside chat. I don't walk around my house in a tie and jacket, but I do wear... One for the fireside chat. And when I look at pictures from the 1950s and and earlier and see how people dress to go on an airplane, how people dress to go to a baseball game, I lament what we have today. Because clothing affects behavior and affects society tremendously. Tremendously. I wear this to honor the fireside chat and honor you. That's how I look at it. Now, a lot of terrific guys show up in a, in a t-shirt and jeans and do great podcasts. I recognize that. The content of the podcast is more important than the clothing. But clothing is important. Very important. In daily life as well. Do you know that when they make dress codes for kids, their grades go up and discipline problems go down just by having the kids dress up nicely? Have you noticed over the years that the average American focuses more on comfort than appearance when they walk out the door, especially at the airport? And uh, have you any idea as to why this is the case? Yes. Uh, Well, in every arena of life, we have dropped standards. So there's no clothing standard. It would have been deemed wrong, socially, even perhaps ethically wrong, to go out out of the house and and mix with others like in a restaurant in a t-shirt. But that has been dropped, obviously. I have, I have retained it. And uh, when I walk through the airport, and I'm, in, in, invariably I have at least a shirt and tie, usually not a jacket. Uh, almost, never a jacket, really. Uh, but a, oh, a shirt and tie because I came from the radio show or I'm a, headed to a speech or whatever the reason. And... There's no question. I know that I know this. People have told me they've done experiments. They're treated better by people. The way you dress does elicit response from people. Madeline 15, Crestline, California, Prager Force. Thank you. How do you spread your beliefs and teach others while still being considerate of their beliefs? What does it mean to be considerate of their beliefs, is what I would have to ask you if you were present. You mean internally or the way you behave? I assume the way you behave. And by the way, what does it mean to be considerate? What if somebody really was a racist and and said that that some racial or religious group deserved to die, let's say? I mean, just to take a crazy example. 
or was or was born inferior, would you be considerate of those beliefs? See, if we have a debate on, on minimum wage, then uh, of course I'm considerate of the other person's beliefs, even though I think that I have more facts and logic on my side, but I, I, good people could differ on minimum wage. Good people cannot differ on, in my opinion, a whole host of other issues, like is a race inherently inferior? That's, that's not something where good people could differ on. And there, and there are many other beliefs like that. But that doesn't mean that you mock them when you debate, because you'll lose. The, the mocker tends to lose. The yeller tends to lose. So there are many, many aspects to your question. All right, Michelle, Lake Stevens, Washington. I enjoy watching your fireside chats. This week when I watched number 221 and you answered a question, <laughs> oh, God, from Muckletea, Washington. I noticed you mispronounced it, and I only pronounced it right because I saw her question earlier. I was just going to let it go, but I then proceeded to watch number 220, where you said you would want to be corrected if you made a mistake. So I thought you might appreciate knowing that Mukulteo is Mukulteo. Thank you for all that and for all Prager you and you do. Well, I do, believe it or not, I love being corrected. It's not noble on my part. It's actually selfish. So let me make the case for why you should want to be corrected. And it's so, it's so obvious that I feel silly making it. Because the next time, you won't make the mistake. <laughs> why is that like self-evident? Why do I want to be wrong twice if I could be wrong once? <laughs> I, I, I'm so amazed when people are offended if they're corrected. Uh, 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 it's a favor to me if you correct me. It's like, do you tell a guy whose fly is open, his fly is open? Well, you don't yell it, but... It's a favor to him to walk over and say, sir, I just want to tell you, your zipper's open. Okay, that, that's a very nice thing to do. Why is the fly open all that different from a mistake? <laughs> and, and, and are you grateful to people who didn't tell you? <laughs> and yet I have to make the case for people wanting to be corrected. I, I really think that that is a good example of the weakening of, of, the, of the character of, of so many Americans, that their ego is shattered if they're corrected. That's all it is. That's all it means. You have a very much, you have a much stronger composition uh, if you welcome corrections. And... Now, people correct you when they're wrong. That's that's another thing. Or if they do it in, in a in a in a contemptuous manner, that's another thing too. I wrote to a friend of mine. I don't know if I mentioned this on on, on a fireside chat because in my brain I remember saying it to somebody, but I don't know. Anyway, so he wrote a non sequitur in in one of his emails to me, and he spelled it wrong. Uh, and I, uh, and I, did I mention that here? Yeah, it's the one she's referring to, I, I think. Oh, really? Because, uh, oh, really? Okay. So I'll just say, I, so I wrote back knowing him, he thanked me profusely. He was so grateful. He wants to spell that word correctly. It's a very good thing to, uh, to, to be corrected, but people, people are softer today than they were. And that's really what the issue amounts to. Now, the truth is, uh, yeah, no, the truth is I'd rather say Mukul T.O. correct, Lee, correctly. I would. Uh, I cannot imagine that this will arise again in my lifetime, that I will mention the name of this city 
<laughs> However, should it ever arise, I will be grateful to Michelle of Lake Stevens, Washington, that I got it right. Thanks for being with me. I'm Dennis Prager. Thank you for watching this video. To keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation.